What's up, everybody? We're back at it. More Murdoch stuff. As promised, we are going to be breaking down the Netflix series today, talking about what we liked, what we didn't like, why certain things didn't come into trial. Um, the, the two main questions I'm looking at this um, Netflix, and then we'll also talk about HBO and some other ones if you guys want to. If you want to continue talking about Murdoch, let me know by liking the video. If the videos still get you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand likes, and people are still watching them and still interested. We'll keep doing them. If people are over them, you can let me know. Um, and we can just move on to the next thing tonight. Actually, I will say we did a new Brian Koberger video earlier, and it was really interesting to dive in to a hearing that was held to discuss whether or not Ann Taylor has a conflict, should have gotten off the Brian Koberger case, what her relationship was like with Kern Odell's mother. Really interesting video. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. Um, it's not alive, but it will premiere tonight, um, kind of around the time we normally hang out at night. So if you guys want to check that out. Um, but this case specifically and the the prism that I watched this documentary through and that I'll watch all of them if you guys are interested are what didn't come into trial and why that's in these documentaries. And if a juror would have watched this series how would it have affected the way they viewed the trial? Because I think that's really the only important way to watch um, these series. I didn't find it overly compelling. I didn't find it overly convincing. I didn't find it overly gross. Like you can see some of these are just like these gross cash grab type of things. Um, but there were elements of all sorts of things throughout this Netflix series. So we're going to break this down first. And then we are going to watch the video of Dick Harputlian talking on the South Carolina floor of the Senate. He said he was not going to mix his political position and his representation of Alec Murdoch. Did he do that? We're going to break that down. The second half of this video will be focused on that. So stick around for that. If you want to hear about what Poot said and how it went and how we think it may affect cases, not just in South Carolina, but in other States. So when we talk about the Netflix series and what didn't come into trial, the overarching answer is a lot of it. A lot of it did not come in to this trial because it's hearsay, it's inadmissible, it is not relevant to the actual murders. And that's going to be the answer to most of these facts that we talk about. But I did think a good portion of the Netflix series, especially episode one, focused on the boat case. And the way that it did come into trial was Alec Murdoch immediately talking about the boat case. You could see from everyone involved, all the parents, all the kids, they looked at the Murdochs and they think it was Paul's fault and Alec and his father tried to cover it up. Law enforcement did a horrible job. Some common themes to what came out in trial. Um, but that was what a lot of these families and victims felt. And so that begs the question that we have to ask. Were they potential suspects in these murders? Because it was very clear they thought it was Paul's fault he went and got too drunk. He wanted to go make pit stops. He wanted to take the boat. Tinsley said he wanted to take the boat to avoid the traffic stops that they knew were going to be happening because of DUI with the oyster roast. That's why he took the boat. Paul was driving, no doubt about it, from everybody in this video. I don't know if it's as clear in you know the legal parameters, but as far as this video go and the, the muster that you have to overcome to get something in a Netflix documentary, which is not exactly the same as what it takes to get something in court, which is why we focus on and trust what comes in at court a lot more than what comes in these documentaries is that Paul was driving. It was all Paul's fault. One thing that was a little bit like made me take it back. I was taken aback. Is that how you say that? I was taken aback a bit is how they talked about Paul, Maggie and Randolph, Alex's father. And it was interesting because most of the trial, it was all positive. It was mostly great things. The witnesses, even the prosecutors were complimenting um, Randolph Murdoch, Alex's dad, Maggie, Paul. They were all close. They were friends. They lost loved ones. But if you watch this Netflix series, they are harsh and tough on Paul and Maggie, especially Paul. Abusive verbally and physically, manipulative, off the handle, a drunk, bad decisions doing whatever he wants, feeling untouchable. And Randolph Murdoch did whatever he could to cover it up, influence people, 
break the law along with Alec. That's how it was portrayed throughout these this documentary. Um, as people talked through, and I got some messages about it, and people talking more about it, Anthony, Mallory's boyfriend, Connor, obviously Anthony, who's Mallory's boyfriend, was angry. He was angry at the scene of the crash. Connor, who felt like, um, Paul was trying to pin it on him that he was driving. He felt like the Murdochs could make him disappear. That was something that was common that everybody knew the Murdochs could just make people disappear. They seem like two potential suspects in this case, especially since Alec mentioned the boat crash as being a potential motive for these crimes. Well, we also found out, first off, we didn't hear any of their names and Alec even said he doesn't think it was any of the victims or their family members. So that was dispelled during the trial. But in the documentary, law enforcement apparently went and did get alibis for everybody involved in the boat crash. So they too were feeling, and Anthony at some point said he was angry because he loved Paul, even though he was mad at him for what he did. It was still one of his best friends. And they were annoyed and frustrated. They think they could have anything to do with this, but they were apparently ruled out as suspects based on their confirmed alibis. So that was interesting. A lot of talk about Alec giving the kids liquor, about Alec being involved in the BUI, um, about him getting sued, him being part of the negligent people involved in this case. A lot of that did come out in the trial. Um, so I don't think any of that would have really changed any view of the juror. Um, and then we did again talk about the abuse and how everybody wanted Paul not to drive. And so if the jury would have watched that, potentially they would have gotten a more negative outlook of Paul and Maggie than what they got in this trial, but I don't think it really would have affected their ability to be fair and impartial or make a call in this case uh, specifically. Um, episode two focused a lot on Murdoch's trying to uh, affect the investigation and a poor investigation by law enforcement. This to me, if the jurors watched it, would have absolutely pointed in the direction that that's exactly what happened in this case. That's exactly what happened in this investigation. Alec Murdoch, once again, affected the investigation, was trying to cover it up. Some of this came out at trial that he was investigated for um, witness tampering or obstruction of justice in this BUI case, and he was never charged with that. He's been charged with a lot of things, not charged with that. So the defense tried to get out ahead of it, but I did think it was interesting in this documentary. That was a big focus. It was a horrible investigation. They didn't want them to find her body. They did everything they could to um, try to make this difficult. They did everything they could for the process of um, the process of trying to do a good investigation. They didn't care. They just want to protect Paul. Alec and and Randolph were able to go in. I think Handsome was his nickname, right? It's hard to remember all these nicknames. Or allowed to go through the the yellow tape and the victim's families weren't allowed to. They were all trying to protect Paul, not Mallory, not anybody else. Tinsley came in, did a great job of explaining, regardless of if you like him or not, did a great job of explaining how based on the accident reconstruction, based on the injuries the other kids had, only Paul could have been driving. I thought it was pretty compelling. Now again, we're not in trial, we're not in court but I think it made sense how they were trying to prove Paul was driving. And at least it was a good argument. You know, if we're talking about, did they have fear they were going to lose? Did they have fear Paul was going to get um, convicted of this BUI? Was he going to look at prison time? Uh, all of that I think was important. Um, a bunch of the cops were their best friends. They've known each other for generations. They're, you know, being the head solicitors for over a hundred years in this area. Again, all parallels, all things we saw in the trial parallels to this BUI um, incident and in, I don't remember if it's, if it was episode two or three in the Mr. Smith, the young kid who was found in the middle of the road and it didn't make sense. And there was a horrible investigation and just kind of went away. That's being reopened and spoken about now, which I thought was interesting. Um, the hospital took his blood. He was absolutely drunk. No doubt about it. Uh, Harpulian represented Paul. And then we get to some stuff that is really frustrating and annoying, right? And a lot of you are probably going to disagree with me because, yes, yeah, Stephen Smith, that was his name. Um, because a lot of you have asked me this and said, you know, you've heard this as well. It's literally reported that Maggie hired a forensic accountant, met with a divorce attorney. She was looking into it. She was going to leave um, Alec. 
and they're reporting it as truth. Not only did it never come in at trial, not only was it found to not be admissible or relevant or it was hearsay or whatever, actually the opposite came in. Now, you can disagree with that, and that's fine. And if you think they had a horrible marriage and you have some reason to believe that, that's fine. It better not be this if you're watching the trial and if you're a juror. It better not be that she was consulting with a divorce attorney because that absolutely never came in. Maggie's sister, uh, people at the firm that were testifying against Alec, Paul's friends, everybody testified to what a great relationship they had. Maggie was happy. Um, she wasn't leaving him. She wasn't staying at the beach house to get away from Alec. She was getting away from everybody else that turned against them. And you can kind of tell, I mean, if you watch this, people were angry at Maggie. People were blaming Maggie for Gloria Satterfield's situation, for Paul drinking, for how the Murdochs worked. She was involved in it and the cover-ups and all that stuff throughout these episodes. And that's why she was at the beach house, not because she was running away from Alec, if you're looking at the evidence that came in at trial. So if a juror watched this, and they started to believe she was hiring a forensic accountant and was going to divorce him, that is huge. That provides a motive that did not exist at trial. Now, I will say exactly zero jurors that have been interviewed post-trial, I've seen four different jurors be interviewed, none of them have mentioned this. So that's good. So hopefully no jurors did watch this and hopefully it did not affect them at all. But that's kind of the prism I'm looking at this through is what came in a trial and what didn't and why, and then if a juror would have watched it, could it have affected the outcome of the trial? Um, let's see what else we got. Okay. Yeah. Episode three is when they talked about Steven Smith. Buster was implicated. Potentially they had some kind of a relationship. It was yet another bad investigation. Uh, Murdoch's were trying to silence that investigation too and stop it. Uh, the, the reporter said something like, you know, I'm a reporter. And if you hear the same rumor multiple times, it's probably some truth to it. It's like, Okay. We'll see how that holds up in court, and we'll see if they end up do prosecuting Buster or anybody around this Stephen Smith situation. And then Paul's girlfriend, who I felt really bad for and what she went through and that relationship. I never love that kind of interaction in a documentary on Netflix like this. And when she says stuff like, they said I should have never killed that slur for a gay person, um... That was a red flag that I ignored. So Paul's getting drunk all the time. He's abusive. His family's covering up stuff, doing horrible things. They're saying things like this and maybe involved in making people disappear, murdering people. And you're ignoring all these red flags. Why? You know, it's always hard to sit in judgment of somebody in that situation because it's really hard. Um, but it's easy to, and I feel like this a lot with Alec Murdoch is everybody was complacent and okay with it as long as it was benefiting them. But as soon as it didn't benefit them anymore or something that they disagreed with, then they turn on them. They take the, the skeletons out of the closet. They do everything they can to, you know, kind of come at them now. And there was a little bit of that in this Netflix series where I felt like they were kicking people while they were down, probably scared to do it before and rightfully so because of all the power that they had. But there were a lot of red flags. And this is the point in the problem is there were so many people, not just these kids, and these are kids, it's totally different, but the lawyers, the bankers, law enforcement, Everybody that was complacent in what the Murdochs were doing has a little bit of culpability in the crimes that were committed, the slew of crimes that were committed. Because if people would have stood up earlier, a lot of this carnage and a lot of these this evil could have potentially been avoided. And it's easy to come out now and pile on, but I hope if people see this happening now in their world, they feel more confident to come out sooner and more confident to try to stop this before it goes too far down the road and has do, too big of a problem. Satterfield, again, this is such a weird story with Satterfield because I swear I heard the attorneys that represent the Satterfield sons say they don't think there was any foul play. They don't think there was any wrongdoing, but now they're reopening the investigation. They're exhuming the body. How are they going to prove if the story from Alec is she tripped over the family dogs? How are they going to prove that Maggie pushed her or that Alec pushed her? Obviously, Maggie's not going to testify. Obviously, Alec's not going to testify that he did it or that Maggie did it. So I don't understand what they think they're going to find that they didn't already find the first time because there were no other witnesses, right? So I just, I don't know what, to me, this seems like they're barking up a tree I don't think is worth barking up. It's going to cause emotional distress to the family even more than they're already going through. 
there's some issues with if it's not negligence, how does the insurance apply? Are they going to lose that settlement if there is some kind of a homicide investigation and now it's an intentional criminal act? Does insurance not cover that? And is it going to end up hurting the victim's families at the end of the day? Because nobody wants that. Rather just leave it as it is and they got the insurance money that they deserve. I think they've gotten it at this point. Um, I just think it would be very, very difficult. Yeah, some people in the chat are saying yeah, they don't think the attorney is or the attorneys have said they don't think there's foul, foul play. So it's it's really, really interesting. And again, there there were allegations that Maggie pushed her, and I, which I thought was very weird. There were allegations, and this is where, again, this is the frustrating part to me, that is just like, stop. Gloria must have found the pills and told Paul, Gloria knew too much. She was going to turn on them. It's like, well, we could have just said, why don't we just say Gloria knew about the financial issues? Because that's a good enough motive for murder as we just proved twice over. So if they want to pin it on Alec, why don't they just say Gloria must have knew, known about the financial crimes and she was going to rat him out for that. Gloria was like family based on everything everybody said. She was basically Paul's second mother. She worked for Murdoch's parents and then Murdoch himself her entire life. There is nothing that leads me to believe that she was going to rat Alec out, even if she knew about it. I think she would be more likely, and I'm not casting any shade towards her, but like family members protect each other. They love her. She'd be more likely to help them cover up a crime in the family than she would to rat him out. As far as loyalty goes, not that she's a bad person, but that she may think that's probably the right thing to do because they're like family and she could be convinced that Alec, that that's what she should do over ratting him out. That's more plausible to me and makes more common sense to me. So, I hated that they did this. I hated that they acted like everybody was turning on each other. It absolutely could have been. It's plausible that it was an accident. It seems like they proved it was an accident and insurance paid because it was an accident. Um, but again, this adds a lot of heartache to me, to the family, but obviously they want to know the truth. So I think in an abundance of caution, if they want to go forward and learn the truth, then I do think that's important. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, but they said, you know, AM got, Alec Murdoch got desperate. Um, it's hard to put us ourselves in his shoes. And then we hear their side of the road incident. Now we know that he's capable of everything. And then we find out about the blood spatter on his shirt. And that was it. It proves he was there and close enough to those murders, regardless of if he did it, he was there. It's like, okay, Netflix. Yeah, that makes sense. Post-production, you probably could have edited that part out. You don't really need it for the next Netflix series. And maybe there was a lot more to it. Cause I think it was just like a one liner. They talk about the kennel video. Um, Paul's ex-girlfriend says, I believe he did it. It's like, well, good. I'm glad we got her opinion on whether or not he committed these murders since she was not there and doesn't have any more information about the murders than anybody else. But you know, if we can get somebody to say, we think he did it, which they had multiple people basically say, you know, they think he did it or they wouldn't be surprised or he was capable of everything of anything. You know, that to me is like, eh, not not very powerful, especially when it starts that line of thinking with the blood spatter evidence on his shirt, which to me is is the big thing that a lot of people, when they were convinced before this trial started, like these people, this was filmed before the trial, clearly, they were all convinced he did it. And I think that blood spatter had a ton to do with it. Because I got to be honest with you, if they told me that Paul and Maggie's blood spatter was on Alex's shirt, I would have been like, guilty, that's enough. He was close enough, he was there, he was wearing that shirt. Blood spatter would have made sense with the shots that were taken. He was close enough within two or three feet. That's what all the evidence was pointing to, right? The stippling and all those questions were already prepared and the theory of the case was going in line with that blood spatter. It all made sense pointing to that blood spatter and then you just pulled that out, which to somebody like me that looks at it, I'm like, yeah, now there's not enough. But a lot of these people were making their opinions and starting down that road because they believe the blood spatter exists. And I don't blame them for that. I don't blame a single one of these kids or a single one of these people in the documentary about this blood spatter because they believed it was true based on law enforcement because they trusted what law enforcement said. Even the attorney general probably believed when his experts said it until they found out, well, probably not. And they had to pivot. And the documentary or docu-series or whatever you want to call it ends with Alec asking on a jail call, if Netflix puts something out about all of this and it ends as if, ha ha, he knows we've got him now. It's like, eh, eh. but anytime, you know, Hey, I, I laugh about it when in court, they talk about people talking about these cases on YouTube. So I get where Netflix is coming there. All right. HBO is even better. A lot of people told me that 
I get it. And if you guys, let me know, type HBO in the chat now if you want us to also break down the HBO um, documentary as well. And I think there was one on Discovery or something like that. I will check them all out if you guys want me to watch them and break them down. If I don't have a channel, I'll buy it and watch it just for these documentaries. If you got, Because I like doing it after the case when we have the context. We know what came in. We know it was admissible. We know what wasn't. And kind of talking about it through this prism about how would it affect jurors and why didn't it come in a trial. It's interesting to me. All right, let's get to some comments. Linda Brown, thank you so much. Last night was wild. It was fun. It was long. It's probably a once in a once in a channel thing. Permanent juror. Based on the interviews the jurors have made, in my opinion, they had their minds made up once the bad acts were brought in. Thoughts. They didn't necessarily say that, but I think that that had a huge, huge, huge bearing on their decision, the other bad acts. Jeep Girl Lily. I've always wondered if AM did this to free his son from serving time in prison for a boat and to save Maggie from heartache and this twisted in his twisted mind. I mean, to me, he could have, they had enough money and connections to just make him disappear, put him on a boat and send him away. If they really wanted that. I mean, they all could have just left if this was all coming crashing down on them, but I don't know. Nicole, did you notice how Anthony said his mom works for sled? That really shocked me. I feel for all of them. Also mother of Paul's ex-girlfriend worked as a jail nurse. Yes, I did notice that they seemed like really nice families. Um, it's Anthony. I just, it felt horrible. I felt horrible for him. Um, but it, it doesn't make any sense that any of these people would have done it at this time. Anyways, I, I like, why wait two years? Why not do it right after if you want to do it? Um, why do it in such a perfect little, you know, window of time. So that didn't really make much common sense to me either. Shady millennial random. Have you been in situations once you've taken on a client when serving the client's interest is in conflict with serving the public interest? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and a lot of people may think that like insurance company and insurance premiums are a public interest and you know, it's, it's lawyers fault with these big verdicts and it's total BS. Insurance companies make billions of dollars. Even when they close down and reopen under another name, they're literally making billions of dollars. The people, um, in the, you know, on the board of directors and CEOs and all those people are literally making billions of dollars. So, I don't ever feel bad for them. So I don't consider insurance companies and helping them out with public interest. But that's the only time I would think it would ever get close. P hop up so late last night. I'll have to join the rewatch crew today. You should do more fun hour, fun nights. I may do some more chill hangout kind of ones and have guests on. And that's the reason I don't have guests on just FYI. I like everybody. No problems with anybody on YouTube. I have fun and enjoy different conversations with people, but I like to keep it at an hour and with just my own hot air being blown and speaking, it's hard to do that. So when you bring other people in, it's really hard. Karen G thoughts on the juror being the deputy witness of a brother. We dug into this a lot last night. The lawyers were okay with it. They know more about the case than me. I would have objected to him and tried to get him off. I can't think of a scenario where I would not object objected to it as a defense lawyer, but they didn't and they let him on. So not an issue. Daria wasn't AM at work when Gloria fell and called him home. I have no idea. I do not know the specifics of that story. I thought Murdoch was the only witness to tell the insurance company that she did fall that proved it was negligence. Susie Wood, you are so insight in, insightful and I live, I love that about your show. Please name Tragos and the jury you know. Yes, if you want to go on the community page and vote for what the chat is going to be called, I think the chat you know, it got the stamp of approval from Emily Baker, so that's hard to overcome that endorsement, but you all will decide. The Tragos tribe, Tragos law tribe, is a very close second. So if you want to affect that chat, I mean, uh, affect the name of what the chat's going to be. Go to our community page, vote on that poll. Um, we're not going to decide yet. We're going to still leave it open for some votes. So let me know. Trish, what do you think of Randy's comments? Again, I did a full video on this one, Trish. If you want to check it out uh, yesterday, I posted. Um, I think it was very interesting. And I think he would have voted not guilty. And he does not feel that they proved Alec did this. But he does think Alec is still lying and knows more than he said, than he has ever said about what happened that night. Daria, stay true. To your insight and intelligence, chat, gonna be chat. Of course, I get it. Christina, check out Eric Allen on YouTube too. I will try to when I have some time. Mary Claire, uh, sick with COVID and passed out a few times into the last night's celebration. I'll be joining the rewatch crew. Thank you, Peter, for all your time, energy, and enthusiasm. Mary Claire, I hope you feel better soon. Hope you beat it. Hope you get some rest. That's like the best medicine for it, I think, is just a lot of rest and a lot of sleep. All right. So let's take a second now. Um, let's watch Harputlian's discussion on the South Carolina floor. 
Can't wait to hear what you guys think about this. It's going to be 1.5 speed. We're going to pause it. We're going to react to it. Is he using his position to try and help this Murdoch case? Is he using his position to have any undue influence on this case? Let's talk about it. Let's listen. I have a lot of thoughts. I've listened to most of it. Um, not necessarily all of it yet. Debra wants the Tragos Law Tribe. It's going to be up to the people. It's up to the people. All right, let's share this. And I also have, I'm going to re-announce the winners here. Um, where did I put it? I put the winners. I'm going to re-announce the winners of the two Yetis. We need you to email us so we can mail it to you um, from last night's chat. It was so long. I'm sure people didn't stay in for the whole four hours. But all right, let's get to this now. Send it. from Charleston, what purpose do you have, sir? Senator, I'd like to ask the senators a question when he is done. Why don't you go ahead and ask me the question? Senator, you, Senator Yield for a question. <laughs> Senator Yield. So first off, he did not bring this up. This was a question asked of him. But when he goes to his planned comments, he does talk about this as well. Sorry, I've been in a snappy event for the last six weeks, so I'm just trying <laughs> well, to... Senator, Yield for well, well, Senator, I just want to make it clear, and this is... I have great respect for you and your legal ability. And um, But did Judge Newman rule against your side, your client, on occasion. I mean, it, look, it's a, it's a six-week process. We'd object, they'd object, he'd rule for us, rule against us. It's, it's now, are you asking me, do I think he made legal errors? Obviously, I mean, we're going to appeal. Does that mean I'm right? No. There's five folks across the street that'll make that decision, and then there's, you know, federal court. So the process is working. I think that's what I want to tell you. Well, Senator, what I wanted to ask you, do you think, because I have an opinion on this, and, I, and one, of the, one of the... What he's trying to get at is, you're an elected official... Did the judge just do whatever you want because of your position, because of your power? I believe, I don't know who this guy is, but I believe he's a lawyer. And what he's trying to do is show we can still be lawyers and have practices and be senators. And, you know, the judges just don't do whatever we say. And a lot of people may wonder, why are they doing this? Why are they having this discussion? The reason is when you become a state senator or a legislator in your state at all, an elected official in your state, that rises you to a certain or raises you to a level of prominence and it makes you more desirable as a lawyer because people maybe think you have influence or maybe think you must be legitimate or a lot of people must like you if you get elected to this position. And then it makes you more profitable, able to charge more money, able to get more clients and better clients. So it's very good for business to be an elected official. And what they don't want to happen is them to put some law in place that you can't have an active legal practice while you're also a state representative. And he is making sure everybody hears it's fair. Harpulian's a great lawyer. He just lost. Judge ruled against him plenty. Judge didn't do whatever he wanted him to. It's a fair ball game, and that's how it should be. And we should be able to keep practicing. So think about that context as we listen to these comments. Criticisms um, against the way that we elect and choose judges in South Carolina is that they'll be beholden to legislators once they get on the bench. Didn't happen in this Do you case. think that happened to you in this case, case, Senator? Trust me, okay? <laughs> I've got a couple big black and blue marks on this rear end of mine. We'll, well, we'll confirm that. Please don't. We'll take your word for that. You don't need to show us. <laughs> but, but I just wanted to raise this. You just can't is, stop with the jokes, of, you know? But again, he's, he's right. He got beat up in this trial. He definitely, they weren't just doing whatever they want or whatever they wanted him to do. This is the most high-profile case probably in the history of South Carolina. And at least in the age of YouTube and Internet, it's certainly what... Um, just grab the, the attention of, of a nation and a world even. But I always often hear this criticism that if, if the General Assembly elects judges, then they're going to be beholden to lawmakers. And I just wanted to make that point. That didn't happen to you during this trial. Senator. There may have been a point. I've been doing this almost 50 years. There may have been a point in the distant past where, you know, you had one senator per, per county. Um, home rule was typically from their home. Um, and things operated differently back then. There wasn't transparency. There weren't computer records. There weren't. Uh, and, and that's evolved so that we're electing a, a different generation, if you will, than when I started out. Um, and I don't sense that um, legislator, leg, lawyer legislators, I don't get it. I mean, what I will get accommodated on is schedule. Um, you know, if I need a motion scheduled on Monday or Friday to accommodate me, that's fine. But I don't, nobody, I don't go into any courtroom saying, you know, I voted for that person, or I know that, I mean, many of them at my age, I knew before they were judges and have a personal relationship with them. I just don't see that, I don't see that happening. Now, I'm not telling you that doesn't happen, you know, in some remote rural area where, you know, it's a different environment than where I practice, um, although I just spent six weeks in a remote rural area, but I didn't see, I didn't, I don't. So he's saying he's not, not going to say it doesn't happen in smaller areas, but from where he's from, it doesn't happen. And it definitely didn't happen in this trial. See that. I will tell you this. I've been around the country. I try cases all over the country over the years, public election of judges, 
is a disaster. I had a case in Texas. I agree with that. I had a case in Texas where we argued a motion, um, and uh, the, the other side, apparently, I was just had local council, contributed a whole bunch of that guy. He was just beating us up. He got unelected before the ruling came out. We had another judge um, who our local council was friends with or contributed to, and we won. So, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, friendship's one thing. Cash is something else. Yeah, and and we do that here, local elections, and we can donate to judges. And I will just tell him, uh, tell disagree with him here that basically all lawyers contribute to like all judges, judges that win, judges that lose. It's very rare that you, um, you know, support a judge so much so, and usually you don't like totally financially back them. But I do disagree with him that donating to campaigns makes you win in front of them. Some of the ones I've known the best and contributed to have pissed me off the most in trial. One of the ones. I mean, I thought was actually pretty horrible in trial um, a few years back uh, and we supported them big time. So I totally disagree with them. I think being the decision maker like they are in their jurisdiction is way more influential than a bunch of lawyers giving money to campaigns for judges, especially when, like he said, we a lot of us have personal relationship with judges. He probably has personal relationships with a lot of judges and he's saying money is more than relationship. No way. Money on the books that's public, that everybody knows that you gave, like if that's changing the mind of judges, that's just stupid. And we've had some lawyers try to make that argument and they have been reprimanded by the bar for making the argument that because some defense lawyer gave money to a judge's campaign, this judge is making rulings in favor of that defense lawyer. So I, I totally disagree with him here, but they are doing their best to protect their craft to protect their ability to maximize their position as elected officials. That's what I feel like this discussion is for. And I'm not saying I wouldn't do the same thing. If I believe that it was fair and I believe it had no influence and I believe that could be a senator at the same time as being a practicing lawyer, I would make the same argument as him. So I'm not faulting him for this, but I do disagree with him that this is less influential than if you donate money to somebody's campaign. Oh, so public elections horrible, in my opinion. So having them appointed by the governor, I think it puts too much power in his hands. Public election is horrible. Yeah, the people who's lie, and this is what we say about public election, and sorry, this this should not have really gone off in this tangent, but the people whose lives are on the line when the judges are making these decisions are the ones who should pick the judges, in my opinion. Murdoch should vote for what judge. Now, he doesn't always win, but he should get a say. The defendants, the plaintiffs in civil cases, the defendants in civil cases, they should get a say in who sits in judgment there as the judge in their cases. Now, they indirectly do because they represent the state politicians or the legislators who then pick the judges. Even Same thing. If a governor, like he's saying, he's got a big problem, too much power with one man, governor elects a, or a, chooses a judge, which we have that as well. Government can appoint, or the governor can appoint judges in certain situations as well. But it's like all of it comes back to people voting and elected officials, whether it's the judge, whether it's a, a legislator, whether it's the governor appointing judges, it all comes back to the people making these decisions or it should. And by the way, we have a retirement system for these judges where they have to serve 20, was it 20 years before they can, they can draw down. So what are they going to be willing to do to make sure they get reappointed? I mean, it's just, this is, I think, well, there are problems with the system. Um, I think this is the best system. Now, would I suggest uh, reforms to the judicial merit selection process? Absolutely. And I'm going to do that this year as these bills come up. I, I agree with you on that. But that, the one issue about popular elected judges, the scales of justice don't have any fingers to stick into the wind. And that's what will happen if we have popularly elected judges. The governor nominating and, 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 and confirmation by advice and consent by the Senate, that is perhaps acceptable. But the main point that I wanted to hear, because I hear this time and again, that people think, members of the public think that we get special treatment as lawyer legislators. And this case demonstrated, I think, to a watching world, you did a great job. You represented your client well. The prosecution did a great job. You think they, there was some error, and that's your duty. If you think there may be, and you have an argument in a case that you, that you, that you appeal, but it's pretty clear that, that you as a, as a senator did not receive any, and, and, nor your client, receive any special treatment. And that, that is not the case in general in, in the state of South Carolina. And we have judges who are going to issue rulings that are impartial. And the most important thing, of a, some, you, you go to court all the time, but when your clients, it's their, usually their one and only day in court. And they're scared to death. They're worried that they're going to be fairly treated. And this system does produce judges like Judge Newman, who I have great respect for and always have, um, to, to, to rule justly and appropriately. Well, and it's sort of unfortunate that, you know, what gets the attraction of the criminal case when most cases are civil cases involving money. Um, and so because they involve money, um, more often they're taken more seriously 
<laughs> because all we're talking about is somebody's life here, real money, yes. um, that's where you would have problems. I don't see it. I don't see judges giving advantages to legislators because they, they elect them. Um, Senator, your five minutes. Senator from Charleston's five minutes has expired. Uh, uh, unanimous consent to give the senator from Richland five minutes. I think the senator from Lexington is going to do the same. So without a judge. I mean, the senator from Richland, five, five minutes, minutes, with the senator from Charleston not asking me questions. <laughs> Without objection, five. Uh, the, the senator has five minutes. Thank you. Um, I originally got up here to say this. I got a number of emails, texts, especially from the senator in. So he wasn't going to talk about it. He was asked a question, but now his prepared comments also have to do with the case. Lexington wanting to know how I was. She always wants to know am I'm eating well, am I sleeping well. Um, and I really appreciate those of you who reached out to me. Um, in this maelstrom of a trial, uh, it is hard to focus on anything except the trial. We've stayed in Walterboro for six weeks. We stayed down there. We pretty well didn't go anywhere, do anything except work on this case. And, and I want to say a couple things about this process. But at first, let me, let me, my, my personal observations are that I've been doing this almost a half a century. And it's still, fun is the wrong word, but it's still as enjoyable today for me as it was almost 50 years ago when I began this process of trying cases. Um, and I've tried hundreds and hundreds of them, big cases, little cases. I've won cases. I've lost cases. But that process, if it operates correctly, can be so satisfying to the lawyers. Now, the client, if they lose, they're not satisfied. If they win, typically they feel like they should have won anyway. So it's really not, um, it's, it's not particularly fun for them or satisfying for them. The second point I'd make is this, and, and the Senator from Charleston has questions about the integrity of the system. Now, I disagree with Judge Newman on some of the rulings he made. We, he ruled, we objected, it's in the record. The court, uh, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals have a chance to look at it, maybe even federal court. But that's not based on bias, or he just had a view of the law different than I had. Now, the third thing I want to say is this. There are, and of course, unfortunately, um, People feel compelled to express their opinion on things through the internet. Somehow they got a hold of, my, I guess it's on my website, my email. I really wanted that big case you had, but that's not what they chose to send me. Um, most of it was very positive. A lot of it were people that were watching this in Germany or England or the Netherlands. Or, I mean, wacky. I don't know. They don't have anything else to do in those countries. But a, a, a bunch of people here also gave me suggestions on a daily basis what we should do or how we screwed up yesterday. But the folks that sent me the, you are a rotten piece of scum, and I hope you die of, let me clean this up a little bit, rectal cancer. Um, you know, what? They have a misapprehension of the system. They have a misapprehension of our justice system. While they're very familiar with the Second Amendment, they're not, they apparently haven't read the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth, or the Eighth Amendments that guarantee us the freedom, the freedom, or guarantee our freedoms of ourselves and our property. John Adams, the second president of the United States, in 1770, eight British soldiers were charged with murdering uh, colonial activists, uh, demonstrators, who charged them. Eight of them were indicted and charged with murder. John Adams represented them, 1770. Six were acquitted, two were convicted of manslaughter, none were, none were hung or, or whatever. Now, he said that everybody deserves the, the presumption of innocence and the benefit of counsel. Why? I don't understand this presumption of innocence and everybody's entitled to a lawyer. It's such an alien concept. Um, but trust me, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, that we, me and my co-counsel, we got emails. Not all of them wish rectal cancer on me, but most of them are fairly critical. Um, and so those are people that don't understand the Constitution. They also understand one other thing. I took an oath 49 years ago. And I pull it out from time to time and read it as a lawyer, because oaths matter. Your word matters. I will maintain the respect and courtesy due to the courts of justice, judicial officials, and those who assist them. To my clients, I pledge faithfulness, competence, diligence, good judgment, and prompt communications. To opposing parties and their counsel, I pledge fairness, integrity, civility, not only in court, but also in all written and oral communications. Now, I've not always upheld that particular oath promise there, but, <laughs> but God knows I've tried. Um, I will maintain the dignity of the legal system and advance no, prejudice, no fact prejudicial to the honor and reputation of a party or witness unless required by the justice of the cause which I am charged. I will assist the defenseless or oppressed by ensuring that justice is available to all citizens and citizens will not delay any person's cause for profit or malice. So help me God. This is an oath I took 49 years ago, and I take it seriously. And by the way, my interest, you don't have to convince me you're innocent for me to represent you. That's not the issue. The issue is, can the state prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? And once you decide that position, once you decide that position, you are free to do what is in your client's best interest. If your mind is muddled with, you know, is he innocent or guilty, you cannot do your job. And I've prosecuted, I put a man in the electric chair, I've defended a man who went to the electric chair. I've done both sides. I'm not a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan. This, that's not what this is about. This is doing your job. So those who out there, this may appear on YouTube somewhere, who don't understand that, go read a book. You know, Abraham Lincoln represented 20 murders. It is, in fact, on YouTube somewhere. And before he gives his, his end of the line spiel, I disagree with a lot of what he said about you know, how he categorizes certain people, which I think is interesting because then he gets mad about people categorizing him. They have nothing to do or they're wacky or whatever, but he is absolutely right. And we talked about this last night, I think with Emily, I can't remember it all kind of is running together about how people get in situations 
where we get to watch these trials, we get to talk about this together, we get to see what happens in our judicial system, and then we ruin it with wishing cancer on people, calling people a scumbag for doing their job. If you don't like his style, he would not be offended by that. If you say, I think you're a little too jokey or sarcastic or, or mean to the clients. I mean, he literally admitted that in his opening statement. He's not going to take offense to that. But wishing harm on him and using his, maybe giving him bad reviews or going on his website and emailing in nasty stuff. It's just like, come on, come on. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that to him. Don't do that to anybody else. I got to be honest with you, not going to change him. Um, it's not going to change anybody doing that to them. But be kind, be respectful, be gracious, even when you disagree. And he just told you what he thinks. And he's being honest. He doesn't care if his client's innocent or guilty. He cares about whether or not the state can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they can't, then he's going to put on a case. So I think it's just important, even if we disagree with somebody, even if we think, you know, they're slimy or whatever. I mean, people have written me messages telling me they think I'm slimy. I think it's because of my hair. And they're like, you know, you're a grease ball. Listen, that's going to happen. That's okay. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? I agree with him that words matter. I agree with him that all of our rights matter. The Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment. All of our amendments matter. All of our rights matter. And I think it's important that we remember that. And the founding fathers of our country, and a lot of you watching are not from our country, but a lot of the founding fathers of our country were lawyers representing people accused of the most heinous crimes you can think of. John Adams, Abraham Lincoln, the list goes on. And those people who we think of as patriots for freedom and fighting for what's right, they also fought for rights like this. And you would not like the country if all it took was sled or in an individual attorney or individual judge to be like, you're guilty, go to prison, bye bye I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what arguments you have. No, you can't talk about the witnesses. No, you can't know who the witnesses are against you. No, you can't ask them any questions. That's the stuff that we have to protect with these rights that lawyers like him do fight for regardless of what you think about their personality or their style. And I think that's, that's important to remember. And I think it's important to remember, just stay out of these people's DMs. Don't get in their personal life. Come in on the chat and we can talk about it and we can talk about what you think about them. Don't go personally to them. Don't come personally to me with, with nasty comments. I don't, I don't care for them. They're not going to change my opinion. They're not going to change me. Frankly, I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to respond to them. So positive uplifting these. And I'm not talking about, let me be clear. I'm not talking about disagreeing with me. I'm not talking about giving me a different point of view. I'm not talking about me saying, or you saying to me, you don't understand this because you have never been through it. I've been through it. And this is what I learned going through it that you might not understand. 100% happy with that. But go at it the right way. And it, your opinion will, will go a lot further. It'll go a lot further. He would have read the emails if it was like, hey man, I think your guy's guilty and I think you know it and you put him on the stand and he's a liar and I don't think we should do that in our judicial system. I think that would have been a totally okay email. But saying you should get rectal cancer because you're helping this you know, murderer and you deserve the same punishment he gets. I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm not about that. Defendants. Not all of them are acquitted, but he fought for every one of them. This is about a system. And by the way, that system doesn't exist in this state without us. That's the attractiveness of being in this body. We shape how that system works. So I've come back from six weeks overseas. Um, and Emily's also, Margie's not here today, but Margie Matthews was very kind in letting us use her office to have lunch in every day to avoid the, and I know this sounds so vain, paparazzi um, who surrounded the, um, the uh, Walter Burrow Courthouse. He smirked Courthouse. when he said it. And by the way, the people that slept outside for nights to get into the courtroom, get some help. Please. <laughs> Soon. Okay? There's something wrong with you. I mean, you know, y'all cheered us when we came in or whatever, but, but you really, really need help. So thank you for, for being nice to me while I was gone. Um, took care of abortion. You have not taken care of guns, uh, majority leader. Um, could have done it all and brought me back without having to deal with that kind of stuff. But I appreciate you at least getting some of the stuff cleared out. The senator's time is about to expire. The senator's well, time expired. Would... Okay. Hey, well, you've got, you've got, you've got. Thank two... you very much. All right. Bunch of you sent me that. So I did want to talk about it. Um, I do think it's important. I'm going to hit a couple more comments and then I do have to take off to my next meeting here. Eyes goal. Mass media has changed. Jury selection has to be transformed accordingly. Jury should be able to watch, listen, and do research and combine the information uh, with the court. In reality, Netflix doc is average as usual, I think. Yeah, no shot, never going to happen. There are just, if, if we want to continue to allow freedom of speech, freedom of publication, um, artistic freedom, for them to put documentaries like this together, that's fine. We cannot combine the two. They cannot go and look at this and use it as part of research. Some of this stuff is absolutely wrong and there's no repercussion for it. 
Um, so for that, that is the point of scrutinizing things and running it through the filter of what is relevant, what is admissible, what is allowed as evidence in front of the jury, throw those rules out. We might as well, then lawyers can start arguing about, you know, look, this Netflix person said it. Look, Paul's ex-girlfriend said he did it. She knows the family. She must be right. Can't allow that stuff. It would really mess up the judicial system as we have it. All right. Um, Colby, in the documentary, at the hospital after the boat crash, Alec, Alex badge was never hanging out of his pants pocket. I think it was Photoshopped in. I heard other people say that. I honestly, I have no idea. I have no idea. I would be surprised if the AG committed fraud. I mean, I get it. You guys could say they did other stuff, whatever, but I'd be surprised. Kim D. Maggie may not have pushed Gloria, but she sure acted like she didn't care about her on the 911 call, did not paint her in a good light. I haven't heard that. I don't know if that's on the HBO one. Azam. Peter, is it okay for Poot to talk about the trial here? Congrats for four hours last night. Amazing. Uh, yes, it's totally okay. And again, he wasn't talking specifics about the case. He wasn't trying to, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but he didn't do what he said he wasn't going to do. He is not going to mix. He is not going to try to affect his representation. He's not going to make decisions in the Senate that are going to affect this case or affect his representation of Alec Murdoch or any client. Now, bringing awareness to things, saying that, look, Judge Newman did not give me preferential treatment. That's really important. Um, and that's totally fair game. Anything you can use your experience to make things better, I think is really important. And that's exactly what he did. And I've got no problem with him talking about stuff like this. As I said, I disagreed with some of his comments, but overall, I don't, I don't see a big problem with it. Boy, mom, this is a great chat group. I love this chat group can disagree and still be respectful. One of my favorite groups, civility is hard to come by these days. And this case has really shown it, but you guys are awesome. I was starting to think that it was impossible to disagree anymore in society and have these conversations without ripping people's heads off. This chat has literally changed that for me. And as it grows, people come in sometimes fiery and hot when they're new. I feel like most people come around. They enjoy the discussion. They enjoy the back and forth. They enjoy, enjoy the disagreement. They enjoy seeing it different ways. Um, and so there'll be some chest pounding when they're right or the other side's wrong. And it's kind of like sports. It's okay. You know, you can brag a little when you're right, as long as it's respectful, we understand. And you might be wrong next time. So always remember that. I always say, you know, the pendulum can swing when your side's in power or when your side's right, don't go too hard. Or you can expect that when it comes back around. Daria, Peter set boundaries on how you should be treated. It's hard. I will say, and I used to read a ton more, um, comments and messages than I do now, but not interested in, in the hate. Jesse Sue meant happy Wednesday. Uh, DJ N works. I think the HBO documentary is less salacious than the Netflix doc, but would love your perspective. I'm going to give it then. I mean, listen, you just, you just paid for a year of HBO. I have no idea how much it costs, but I'm sure you just paid for a year of it here. So we will get it. We will break down the HBO documentary as well. Leslie P you're so right. We take our list legal system for granted, not just our legal system, but the cameras and microphones. Now that we get in the courtroom, that can all be stripped away at judicial discretion. And they can point to those emails from Dick Harpulian from the stuff happening in the Idaho case to the stuff happening in the Lori Vallow case. They can point to those things and pull the cameras and pull the microphones. And then we're left with just reporting. And we know how that works out. So I, that's why we got to realize we got to work together in this. Nora, my thoughts on the docuseries. All those so-called friends of PM are opportunistic, especially his ex-girlfriend. Sue, I am still proud of you. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. And Azam, thank you for this super sticker. Yes, I see a lot of people posting HBO. I will watch the HBO um, at some point. I, I am going on a flight this weekend, so maybe I will download it um, to my iPad and watch that HBO documentary on my flight. Maybe we'll talk about where I'm going. I guarantee there are, it's a big city, so I guarantee there are people in this chat that are from there, that live there, that would have some recommendations of things for me to do with the kids on spring break because we want to see maybe some cold weather, maybe some snow. We'll see. We'll talk more about that. Um, stay tuned for the Koberger video tonight. I enjoyed the content. I thought it was really interesting, and I really, really, really want to hear your all take on it. Um, hit that like button on the way out if you haven't already, and please make sure you subscribe. We're almost to 211,000. Every single little milestone is fun. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Not New York City. We'll talk more about it on a future video. Appreciate you all. Until next time, I'm out of here.